Hello, everybody. Uh, today we are dealing with um, the, this is our presentation all called Trouble in Ireland. Subtitle is Partition and its Consequences. We're also dealing with the causes. Uh, this is a particular topic that we're covering in this episode. This is episode one, uh, which I've subtitled as uh, Houses Built on Sand. Uh, the word trouble is in scare quotes because trouble can mean a lot of different things and it is usually a loaded term in terms of, uh, of its relation to Ireland. In the background there you can see a rough map of the uh, area which well, was partitioned off uh, in 1921-22 and you can see uh, the, the, there were six counties there, and they were cut off from the, the rest of Ireland, the 26 counties, in, in a move uh, done pretty much unilaterally by the British. And uh, you, you can see the quite haphazard, irregular formation of, of the border right there. And there you, you can see how roads... Uh, are uh, cross over into into one from one county in, into another um, in a completely arbitrary fashion, and that's because there was really no border there to begin with. Okay, right. We're going to go way back now to to start off. We're going to deal with the. Uh, Society of the United Irishmen. Now, uh, this is quite important, even though it goes way back to the 1790s. It's quite important because the Society of the United Irishmen were a revolutionary group that was formed in Ireland, inspired in part by the American Revolution, but more importantly, by the French Revolution. And this is their banner the uh and they and their um and their and their quotes there you can see them at the bottom liberty equality and justice which of course mirrors what the uh what the what was the slogans of the of the french revolution what's what's particularly interesting about the society of the united irishmen was that they believed in revolutionary change and that Ireland could only get its, its independence through a unity of uh, Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter. Now, when I say Protestant, I mean Anglican. This, that's follow, followers of the Anglican Church in Ireland. Uh, these, this generally applied to, to only to land, landowners at this point, and quite wealthy landowners, but it, it also applied to, to some of their uh, of their helpers in the in the cities, such as lawyers and, and people like that, um, where also would also be Anglican. And um, in the north, uh, those of English descent would would also generally be Anglican. However, there was also quite a large proportion for, for of Scottish descent and also some of English, English, English descent who were what's known as dissenters. Now, dissenter means that uh, you don't accept the authority of the, of the Anglican Church. You're a Protestant, but you don't accept the, the, its, its authority. And dissenters were often a lot more radical than, than Anglicans. However, the Society of the United Irishmen included all three types, including, including the Catholics who were very discriminated against. Um, they, were the, they weren't allowed to own, own more than a very small amount of land. Uh, Protestants um, were the only ones who could own large amounts of land at the time. And the dissenters were similarly treated to 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 Catholics, um, dissenters and uh, Anglicans of a tenant status, that is lower class status, 
were largely confined to the nine provinces of, of Ulster. Uh, and even within those, they, they were, it was generally, there were only about four or so counties of the nine that had a Protestant uh, majority. Now, um, so the Un United Irishmen were, were um, they, they uh, rebelled against the British rule uh, in 1798. It was a unity of, of particularly of, of Catholic and dissenter. Um, and they both fought, fought, fought the British occupiers in 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 a number of of different battles all over Ireland, some in Ulster and some in in the west of Ireland, and some also in in the southeast of Ireland. And uh, the the Anglicans um, by and large didn't didn't take part, or they were already part of a reactionary organisation known as the Orange Order. And the Orange Order um, you may have heard of. It was a, a formation that was included landlords and it included tenants, um, but, and also uh, professional class people as well. But, um, but it, was, it was, at this stage, it was completely Anglican. There were no dissenters in it at all because the they, they, they were seen as being the enemy as much as, as, much as the Catholics. And uh, however, some, not, not very many, but some Anglicans uh, did actually join the, the Society of United Irishmen, in particular Lord Edward Fitzgerald, um, who was actually killed by British forces during the uprising. The uprising was put down very savagely. Uh, so they estimate some 50,000 people were killed. Uh, and uh, the British forces took quite serious revenge because they didn't want to repeat of, of what they had experienced in North America uh, about a decade uh, or two beforehand. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide now. Right, this is, this is a caricature uh, I think it was originally in Punch or some mag magazine like this, um, where the uh, the the um, this is to denigrate and to de degrade the United Irishmen. Um, so they were they didn't have any ideals according to this this uh, this picture. They're just a bunch of savages, um, stupid savages, and um, lazy, and um, which is which is the which is one of the tropes that is con consistently played throughout the entire British occupation uh, up until relatively recently, and uh, and it it portrays the Irish as being stupid, indolent, and um and violent and this is this is uh this is how the united irishmen were portrayed in british propaganda at the time so as you can see all those tropes of the stupidity and the violence and the um and the sort of semi subhuman um uh, physical characteristics of the irish are in full display, and it doesn't really matter if they're if they're if they're Catholic or Presbyterian or whatever they are. Um, it's just Irish people. This is how they are depicted. Okay, so we now have two maps here, and if you if you look across the one on the on the left. We have a uh, we have four areas of Ireland. These are the provinces, the administrative provinces. Now, the original original Irish um, Irish provinces, if you like, or Irish political entities. The Ireland was never united before the British made it. So this has to be acknowledged. Um, but the the um, 
this this is is actually what was put into place round about uh, the late seventeenth century. So um, so from that moment onwards, this is the four main administrative areas that the British administration, who were based in in um, in Dublin or the Anglican, should I say, administration based in in Dublin. Um, that basically Ang Anglican landlords, etc., who had a parliament there, and so on and so forth. This was what they, this is how they divided up the, the country. Now, some of these uh, provinces do bear some relation to to their historical um, uh, counterparts, but but um, in, in the case of Ulster, um, sometimes Ulster was only two counties. That's um, the two on the um on the on the east coast these two sometimes it was only this uh sometimes it wasn't it, it um it was a much bigger area that that included um most of what what is now um uh the nine counties of Ulster except except for these two two counties and there were various other oscillations in between. Um, the other ones I won't talk about too much because they're not really relevant to what we've got to talk about. Right, okay, so over on the right, we're now moving on to the, uh, to the population fall in Ireland. Now, Ireland's population had been going up steadily um, throughout the 18th century. Um, it had been quite devastated by the by the wars of the 17th century, 16th and 17th centuries. But in, in the 18th century, it started to climb very rapidly. And part of the reason for this was that the landlords at the time, they, these were the Anglican landlords that I've been speaking about, they, they had a um, vested interest in having as many tenants on the land as possible. So, um, and they were, and they used to subdivide the land because, because, because basically a lot of them were, were, well, they were aristocrats and they, and they wanted to, they didn't really want to invest like, in the capitalist sense, they they didn't really want to invest in the, in their in their property. What they wanted to do was to raise as much money for it that they could squander in in either in Dublin or or in London um, at gambling houses and whorehouses and um, and in extravagant lifestyles and hunting and shooting and fishing and all the other things that aristocrats love to do. And um, and and for this, they they needed more as inflation went up. They, they needed more and more tenants, and this is why the Irish population went up, shot up tremendously in the 18th century. And initially, it served Britain very well because the um, because there there wasn't enough work for for the Irish in 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 order to pay these rents. So they had to, to emigrate in, in, um, in a, on a temporary basis. They had to emigrate across to, to, to Britain and they had to have, and they would eventually end up working on the railroads and um, on building the canals, but um, in the, which would, which was all part of Britain's growing industrial revolution. Um, and and their labor would be would be one of the of the cornerstones of that development um but it, initially it was on, it wasn't permanent it was only a temporary thing so they would go back home when that when the when the job was completed they would go back home to ireland and they would continue to pay their rents for their for the lands and the lands were getting subdivided and subdivided and smaller and smaller holdings especially on the west coast of ireland um in particularly the uh, central central west and the southwest and in a few other parts if you if you look at this this picture 
uh, picture here, it shows er the areas where it was most catastrophic. So you can see the dark red areas, that's where it, it hit the hardest. And um, and then the, the lighter red areas are areas that were hit reasonably bad. Um, and the the pinkish areas were not so bad. And the uh, and the green areas were the only places, and these were urban areas, of course, where the population level uh, went up. And as you can see, there there was a big uh, there was a big population increase in Belfast in the north. Uh, you can see one green area there up in up in the, up in the northeast, and then there was another huge one in Dublin as a re result of the famine, which I'll, I'll explain in a second. Um, and the, the um, and in so much so that originally Dublin had been an almost entirely Protestant town throughout the 18th century and the early 19th century. But by the middle of the 19th century, where you have the famine, which starts around about 1845, and finishes approximately 1850, 51, something like this, um, it suddenly becomes an overwhelmingly Catholic city. And, and then you can also see Cork similarly, because Cork was one of the areas very close to, to the devastation that was to occur. So lots of people fled into, into the city of, of Cork in the south. Now, the, um, the actual famine, uh, it was universal across Europe. It was a failure of the potato blight. And lots of people might ask, well, why did everybody else seem to survive? So why did the Irish not? Um, now, the, it's, it's a bit more complicated than, than that because or uh, the the famine certainly did or the the potato blight certainly affected other other regions but not as heavily as it did the west area of ireland uh parts of the midlands you can see this this area and this area here um were very badly devastating a bit over here um and the south uh, and the southwest of ireland was particularly badly hit. Now these were the areas where the, there was the most subdivision of land and where the um, where the people survive basically on the potato because uh, in, a, in, a, in an area of, of land that, that you have, you, you've only got maybe an acre or two, whatever, you can still grow enough to feed your family just with potatoes. Now there might be a couple of other things like um, there might be a, maybe a few carrots and onions and and uh, and there might be some um, some some cabbages um, and if you're lucky to live near the sea there might be seaweed uh, seaweed could be used as food and indeed uh, our shellfish but pretty much everything else that you would gather on the shore um, but but uh, but your main bulk of what you survive on is the potato. So when the potato blight hit hit Ireland in in, um, in roughly about 1845, uh, it was absolutely devastating. And um, Ulster, for the majority, uh, stayed stayed um it was the least affected you can see even on the on the west coast of ireland in donegal donegal was was one of the areas even though it it, it had a same same sort of uh uh existence as as um as as the other west coast areas of, of ireland it wasn't it wasn't so badly hit and um so, so therefore, there was a division in 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 who was who was being af affected the most, and it was an absolute catastrophe on the on the uh, in the in, in the west coast, uh, in, in the centre, 
um, in certain areas in the centre and in the south southwest. And uh, we've now gone and deal with what this catastrophe might be. Right, so this illustration here gives you an idea of what sort of horrors were involved in, in the famine. Now, this is a workhouse. Uh, this, this is a place where, where uh, poverty-stricken people were supposed to go under, under British law at the time. And there they would receive some sort of food, usually not very much, um, and very basic food, but they would receive something, uh, but they would have to work for it. Um, so it was basically a form of free labor for the for the state. Um, the state had several of these workhouses all over all over uh, both Britain and Ireland, and the conditions within them were quite diabolical. Um, and here you can see a big crowd. This is in Ireland in in the in the eighteen forty seven. The, the the worst year of the famine for the Irish, and they're clamoring to get in. Now, most of these people would have been already dying. It has to be said that they would have already been dying of starvation. Um, what, what originally happened in the first couple of years of the, of, the, of the famine, 1845 and 46, the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the British government was under a man called John Peel, and John Peel was a Tory, uh, but he did actually try to introduce some sort of relief for for the for the for the destitute Irish who had nothing to nothing to eat, um, and he he did that largely by introducing public works. So it was sort of like an outdoor version of, of, of the workhouse, but it kept, it did keep more people from, from starving. But by the time most people went to the, in 1847, they went to the, to, to the, to the, to the workhouse and they clamored to get in, like you see in this picture, most of those people would already be beyond saving they would be they would be in the in the beginnings of terminal starvation and once they got inside they would die like flies or if they got inside because as you can see they're probably not all going to get in and the other ones will die like flies outside it's it, and the devastation of this um uh, experience is still felt throughout ireland the um the, the memory of this horror that 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 people were forced to endure um, I have to say that um the the in, in 1847 there was a new government in in Britain um it was it was a liberal government actually headed by Lord Russell and Lord Russell was an out and out free marketeer and and he thought, well, you know, if 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 these people can't get a living for themselves, why should we provide it for them? So he took away all the all the out um, all the uh, all the uh, outdoor relief in the form of um, road construction, things like this. Here, um, they they took it all all away and they just said well you know let let the market decide and if they if they're going to starve they're going to starve if they're going to emigrate they're going to emigrate and so on and so forth so within ireland's population in 1841 uh, was uh, around about 8 million uh it had grown exp exp exponentially as i've already explained and um and but suddenly within 10 years between 1841 and about 1852 the the uh the the population drops by one and a half million and then it carries on dropping and it doesn't start to to increase again until much much later on um and the initial deaths are mostly on the west coast Oh, in those dark red areas that we were looking at earlier, 
Um, and we, we think that the vast majority of the people um, who disappeared from those areas just died because they were too poor to afford to even to emigrate. The ones from the Midlands, they made a trek across to, um, to, to the coast, to Dublin and so on. And, and those that got on the ships, a lot of them died on the ships and they were buried at sea. Um, and then from there, they would go to, um, they were taken on, on ships to either you know, the United States of America or to Canada or to Australia or other, other British colonies. Right, we can go on now. So we got um, in this trauma, and you know it, it is a trauma that Irish people are still still aware of even even today. Um, this absolute catastrophe um, caused it to you know partly by the landlord system, and and partly by uh, the actual policies of the British government, especially the Russell government, with their. Uh, let, let's let's bring in the free market and let the free market run riot policy. Um, the, the 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 people who um, who were to come out of this, to who were to be ex extremely influential in Ireland, were unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, two of the most wrong people to do so. Um, one, of course, is very famous today. He's the one on the left. Uh, he's known as Daniel O'Connell or the Liberator, as he's sometimes called, mainly because of his role in uh, in in achieving Catholic emancipation. Now, Catholic emancipation was already on the cards, so uh, Daniel O'Connell can't really take the entire entire. Um, credit for it because they were already aware that that this policy that they'd had of had in the past of just the anglicans being in in control of all the land in ireland was not working and so therefore they were going to have to make make a a um make some allowances and they were going to um uh, make uh, or uh, allow um catholics and and uh and dissenters or Presbyterians the same rights as 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 the Anglicans. Uh, so so Daniel Connell was really on a winning horse right from the word go. Um, and he 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 was an Irish speaker, um, and he was a a um, he was actually quite a quite a wealthy landowner. Uh, unusual for for Catholics in the time, uh, and he was also, unfortunately, he, he was also he 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 promoted his Catholicism very strongly, and he was turning, starting to turn the the um, the nationalist movement, which had been a republican movement and which had been secular. And um, in and uh, to do with with the equality of all the different uh, faiths in Ireland, he was in the process of trying to to turn it into a uniquely Catholic thing, and he wanted to achieve a a, a um, situation known as Home Rule, where Ireland would get its own 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 Parliament and so on and so forth. Um, under under the British Crown. Now the Republicans, the United Irishmen, were completely against that. And um, anyway, that's that's enough of, of Daniel O'Connell. He was extremely influential, especially in in Western and in Southern Ireland. And this would have consequences later on. Uh, the man on the right, this is um, Paul Cullen. Now, Paul Cullen was a, um, he was in the Catholic Church, as that's pretty obvious. And he became, in due course, he became primate of Ireland. 
He became primate of Ireland uh, with, uh, under the the the, the ideol ideology of ultramontanism, or is it sometimes known in more um, comprehensible English, um, a, a Catholic devotionalism? Um, this was this was a creation of Pius the Ninth. Now Pius the Ninth was very conservative uh, pope and he's uh, also responsible for the first vatican council so paul cullen uh it, it was actually at odds with a lot of the catholic clergy in in ireland at the time who didn't really want anything to do with this um the, the catholic clergy in ireland were actually a very small group um not been many people realize that but this but m many people in Ireland didn't didn't get any um they may have had a a, a baptism um and they this is up until up until Paul Cullen's reforms start to take effect which which as I say increases the number of the clergy exponentially and it also increases, increases the number of churches and abbeys and and what have you um, exponentially as well, and the seminaries for priests, uh, Maynooth College being being one of them, and the British were quite happy to help someone like Pius, um, not Pius, um, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Cullen. So, so he wasn't by any means anti 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 British either, because um, because the because they they saw saw the the Catholic Church as being a, 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 a positive for them because it would help to um, dismantle all this talk about republicanism and and uh, and secular um, revolutions and things like this here. So and and he was dead against this and he was very much in favor of private property and um, and the most. Uh, conservative um, and reactionary, in fact, um, versions of uh, sexual mor morality. Um, now, the Irish, bef up, and, up until this point, they they'd had a reasonably lax approach to to things like sexual morality. It wasn't really seen as being a big big problem, um, but Pius the Ninth. It, and and uh, his his acolyte in Ireland, that Paul Cullen, they 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 put a, a stamper on that, and they fact in fact their their version of of um, Catholicism more closely resembles Protestant fundamentalism. Now this is very very interesting with a sort of puritanical um, fear of of sexuality. And um, and and they were um, and re repression of it, and and this is this is what this is the this is the ball game he puts in motion. And both of these these men, unfortunately, are going to have a big influence on what comes next. Just before I leave this page, uh, I should tell you that a similar process is is being enacted in the. Protestant dissenter community in this period. Um, now, as I said, the Protestant dissenter community in the north, the tenants, that is, rather than the, than any landlords they might have, um, they were, the, uh, uh, and those who were now moving into the cities en masse, and, and because the, the, um, the one of the consequences of of the famine um, is to is to encourage, and this is what the Russell government in particular were very keen on, was to encourage a new breed of landlord in Ireland. This is a a um, a cap fully capitalist landlord class. So so the fully capitalist landlord class, whether it appears in the north or whether it appears in the south, what their main objective is is to uh, make the land profitable um, that is not not so much you want to get rents out of them you just want them off the land and the because because you can make do with having a few only a few laborers 
and and you want to bring in sheep and cattle and things like this to replace them uh, because sheep and cattle are very profitable human beings in the in the in the more advanced version of capitalism that we're dealing with are not so profitable okay next we move on so we have the growth of the home rule movement as i say this starts initially with uh, daniel connell we've been dealing with before and it starts to to um, acquire as it as it spreads it starts to acquire quite a conservative in on one level um, nationalist um, character with uh, heavily associated with Catholicism. However, this wasn't entirely the case to begin with. Um, now, over here on, on the left, we have Charles Stuart Parnell. Now, Charles Stuart Parnell, Parnell um, that's, that's this, this fellow here. Um, he's sometimes called the uncrowned King of Ireland. He was a home rule politician, very charismatic. And uh, he was actually landlord um, of Anglican descent. Uh, in for, of Irish Ang Anglican descent, and he led the movement in its most expansive period, where it, it really took hold in Ireland. But unfortunately, he was reliant for that in terms of getting the propaganda out to the people. Uh, he was reliant heavily on the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church well, as I say, had grown exponentially in Ireland and in terms of the number of priests and the number of churches and so on and so forth, people were starting to go to the churches much more often than they had before. But as I say, before it had been just a baptism, maybe a, um, a confirmation if you're very lucky, um, marriage, probably even if you're luckier, um, and, and your last rites, and that would basically be it. Um, you would definitely get the, the first two of those and probably not any, any more. And you'd never see a, a clergyman in, in between times because there were hardly any of them running around. Um, but, but this all changes and suddenly the, the, the priests and then everybody who's been uh, turned off the land, maybe some of them have gone into the seminaries, you know, their, their sons and their, uh, have gone into seminaries and the, their daughters into, into convents or whatever. And so, so, so therefore there's a connection, there's suddenly a big connection to Catholicism um, in, the, in, the, in the Irish independence movement. And because of Daniel O'Connell, it becomes a reformist thing. And uh, Charles Stuart Parnell is a reformist leader, uh, but he is reasonably principled one, um, not entirely principled, but he he did have, uh, he did, and he played as well, not only to the, to the, um, to the to more conservative elements in Irish, uh, in the Irish Home Rule campaign, but he also played to the more radical elements which we'll be dealing with shortly. Um, over there on the right, we can see a, uh, a, a picture which is um, called Erin er, uh, un unfurls um, her flag. And um, this, is, this is a, post, a poster or, or a postcard that is um, early, early, this is about 18, 1880s, um, that, that uh, uh, plots out um, a propaganda um, trope for home rule. So Ireland's presented as a woman and she's got a, an Irish wolfhound at her, her, her feet and she's unfurling, unfurling the banner. But we have to say that in comparison to the unionist ones, which we'll be dealing with as we go along, the, the home rule banner is 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 very um, or, or the or not the home rule banner that the home, home rule propaganda um, is very limited um, because they they don't have the resources. You see you'll see the difference um, when we come to the to the 
to the unionist anti-home rule campaign uh, because they obviously had far greater resources in terms of um, the access to the media. Now, the media in these times was was the was a clergy. Um, so so you needed the clergy to 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 be able to um, propagate your your ideas. Um, unless unless you had access to to the so printing presses, um, both in, in the media, um, I mean, there was no TV and there was no radio. So um, so you had to have control over these uh, resources, which the unionists, unfortunately, had a great advantage in 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 holding. Now, as I was saying, the there was a big big problem within the home rule movement in that it was seen as being a movement of anybody who identified themselves as Irish. As we can see, we're starting to see a movement, a drift towards Irish being not, uh, being, being, um, being sectarian in nature. So, so Irish being predominantly associated with being Catholic rather than being, being Catholic, Protestant or dissenter. But this process is still not complete as yet. And um, and it has to be said, Parnell was probably one of the best home rule leaders they they had, but he was he was uh he he was attacked in a in a campaign because they found out he was having an affair with a woman named Kitty O'Shea. And they um and they and they pilloried him and destroyed him. His career, and he died shortly afterwards. Um, this left led left the the field open to to other people who wanted to replace him, and of course they had a great time uh, pulling him down as well. And the Catholic Church had a great ball pulling him down because the Catholic Church was under the influence now of this devotional puritanical form of Catholicism. Um, so they they had a ball as well, and he was he he was destroyed, and the the left of the or the more radical elements of the home rule movement, um, the the fringes um, were destroyed in the process. Um, now this this shows what what else was going on in in Ireland on an economic level. Um, so we were talking about um, people being being um, evicted as as a means of the of this new landlord class um, who are most still mostly Protestant, but in in increasing numbers were also Catholic. It has to be uh, reinforced. This. Um, Especially in certain parts of Ireland, they were um, increasingly Catholic. Um, especially in the in the in the east and towards the centre of Ireland. And the the um, and here you can see you can see uh, an eviction in in progress. Now there was a resistance movement to this eviction process. Because the the, uh, the the eviction process was carried out um, under with the backing of military force. Now you can see British soldiers there, and they are actually um, it, it, taking part. You can see the 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 evictors there, the evicting officers, um, the bailiffs, or whatever you want to call them. Um, they they are they are, are trying to there's there's people blocked in this in this building they've locked themselves in and um, to to prevent the themselves being evicted there's a big gathering crowd of of Irish peasants supporting them outside and the British army is there to as the British army would say to keep the peace but in reality to defend private property and this process is going on throughout the 1860s 1870s the Irish Land League is formed um, it's connected to the Fenian movement the Fenian movement is a sort of continuation of 
the United Irishman, if you like, but it's becoming increasingly um, more and more Catholic. Um, uh, and it, it, but not entirely, because this this sort of stuff was going on in Ulster as well. So people were still being 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 evicted because the the um, yeah, capital has no has no boundaries. So so um so the so the new type of landlord that were pre pre appearing in the in, in the north they were quite happy to get rid of their Presbyterian and Anglican um tenants as much as as much as Catholic ones. So a not quite a number of of um. Presbyterian in in particular um, uh, tenants who were facing eviction and, and were seeing their friends and their neighbours and family evicted, they were also sympathetic to the Land League, despite the fact that it was connected to the Fenian movement, which was seen as being these nasty Catholic um, Republican people. Um, so and it has to be said, Charles Stuart Parnell, he took a, he took the side of of the tenants in this. In he didn't he, he was a bit he, he didn't entirely play it straight with them, but but he did actually make efforts. Um, and one of his right hand men was Michael Davitt. Michael Davitt was a Fenian um, and a and a socialist. Um, he was actually um, he actually was raised in England. He was of Irish descent, but he was raised in Manchester and he lost his arm in a factory as a child because they were using child labor in 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 factories. And he lost his 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 arm or one of his arms doing um while he was doing that. Um and later on he became a revolutionary. He's quite an important figure. Right. Uh, we'll now move on. So um, in the 1880s, there, uh, this man, uh, William Gladstone, takes, takes office in, um, he's a liberal. He takes uh, office in, in England and he decides to push through this idea of home rule. Now, his idea of home rule um, is much the same as the most conservative elements that would be the sort of Daniel O'Connell um, elements of the Home Rule movement. So nothing to do with land. <laughs> he wouldn't have any time for the Land League and he, he wouldn't have any time for Fenians or, or anybody like this. Um, so what he's he, he is pushing for is, is a Home Rule, which uh, the no Home Rule movement, which starts up round about this time, round about 1886, where he introduces his first um, Home Rule bill, um, is is uh, is for uh, it's for the the um, hold on a second. Let me have a sip of water. Yeah, it's it's um it's aimed to encourage, and as, as I say, they've already encouraged, and and um, the funds from from Roman etc. are also um, supporting this a sort of very conservative ver version of Home Rule. So there's a reaction in certain elements of the Protestant community, and no Home Rule campaign. Come, uh, comes into being. And some of these are again led by reactionary elements, um, people connected to the Tory party in particular. Um, and they and they are um, against the whole idea of, of home rule because as they say, home rule means Rome rule. And um, so they, they start off some, some riots. And uh, here we can see um, some of these carrying on. So we have the no home rulers and presumably on the other side of the picture, which you can't see or over on the right here, you would have the the um, the home rulers. And this is in, in the city of Belfast. This is mainly where this is carrying on. And um, and there's there's a whole lot of uh, lower class elements, of course, who've been whipped up 
by the by the factions on both sides, and and then the British police at the time, known as the Royal Irish Constabulary, um, are coming in to break it up. And this is a this this picture is although it's an illustration, it gives it, it also um, fulfills another one of the tropes that the British um, uh, version of of events in Ireland. Uh, is always wanting to to repeat, which is um, the these Irish they're irrational and they and they argue all the time and that they fight each other um, and they're um, completely lawless and we have to come in and and restore order. We're we're the piggy in the middle and we're getting hit by stones from both sides. Um, this is this is this is a trope which will be repeated throughout uh, right up to about the 1990s and maybe even beyond is, is they still haven't really got rid of it, but they have. Um, but it is much lessened um, since the Anglo-Irish agreement in, in the 1990s. Um, but but anyway, this is this is a, just an illustration of this is the start of this no no home rule and well the home rule campaign and the no home rule campaign. Uh, so this is in eighteen eighties onwards, mid eighteen eighties onwards. Okay, next slide. So we now can see this is Belfast, uh, early photograph of Belfast. I think it's around about nineteen hundred, something like this. And in the background, we can see the shipyards. The shipyards were a big, big, important, important element of, of British power. Um, the, the, uh, the Belfast shipyards were producing massive amounts of both merchant and navy ships for the, for the British, um, both maritime and um, Navy and, and also for the for the military navy, um, and of course Britain's navy at that time was what was really dominating the the world. And Britain still thought, despite the threatening signs from the United from a now United United States with with that with the civil war over, um, that things weren't going to remain that way. And also signs from Germany that things were not going to remain that way. Uh, the the British um, were still full of hubris, or the British government was still full of hubris, and and Belfast shipyards was was uh, was seen as being one of the keystones of of the British uh, maritime industry, and it was also run by a man called William Pirier. Now William Pirier is interesting because he was a he was a Protestant. I think he was even a Presbyterian. I'm not entirely sure about that, but he was um, he was uh, a home ruler. Uh, he was a liberal and he was a home ruler, but he was also a, 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 a ruthless exploiter of his workers. He believed in in the in free trade, and he believed in making making as much money as he possibly could. And of course, all the workers were flooding in, predominantly Protestant workers from who were being evicted, as I say, or forced out off their land um, to to go and work as proletarians in in the city where they would in Belfast in 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 particular where they would either work in the linen mills or they would work in, in the shipyard. And um, it was predominantly women who worked in the linen mills and men who worked in the shipyard. Uh, and there was also the docks, of course, which were uh, they sort of settled down to be to be sectarianized. So although the uh, the mills were had both Protestant and Catholic in them, and there was also a tobacco factory, Gallagher's, um, that uh, and, and they were both Protestant and Catholic workers. The shipyards became predominantly Protestant workers, and the uh, docks became predominantly Catholic workers. Um, now, as I say, William Pirier 
he he was actually a home ruler, and this was quite this was becoming increasingly unusual. Most most um, most northern capitalists um, were now starting to side with 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 the landlords, the the sort of old old guard um, Tory Tory landlords. They were starting to side with them, and they were starting to see that their interests were much better served with a united. Um, you being united with with Britain than than under 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 Home Rule, so they were starting to to mobilise now against it. But William Pirie was 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 one of the of the few who remained, um, I believe, uh, to his his death. I think he remained a Home Ruler. And um, but as I say, that he combined that with exploitation of his workers. So, so therefore, if if you were a, an ignorant um, Protestant peasant who come in from the countryside, and, and you were um, then then it would be very easy for the propaganda of 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 the unionists to say, well, look, well, look at w w William Perrier. You know, he's exploiting you. Uh, and he's also a um, he's also a home ruler. So therefore, your interests are with the no home rule uh, campaign. So so the, you can see how things are starting to develop in in, in Ireland. Uh, and as I say, there's been a similar process amongst Protestant um, the uh, the the trauma of the famine is not not nearly as bad as, as it was amongst, or even in Ulster, whether you're Catholic or Protestant or whatever, um, uh, in terms of the impact of the, of the famine, but the, the trauma of being evicted from your land or being forced off your land by, by, um, by ever increasing rents um, from, your, from your landlord, who wants to get rid of you and replace you by sheep or um, horses or cattle is is um, is this boot gives a big boost to 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 a, a Protestant fund um, or a Protestant dissenter um, fundamentalism which wasn't there before before Protestant fundamentalism had been largely associated, not entirely, because there were conservative elements right from the word go, but um, but the um, dissenterism had been associated with with uh, radical radical politics, um, but increasingly it becomes associated through through the mediation of a of a very conservative form of dissenter protestantism a fundamentalist one very similar in fact to catholic devotional um, practice so so the two things are actually intertwined okay next we are going to look at there's there's a big uprising um as well as these ideas that we've been talking about we're talking about home rule and no home rule and all the rest of it there are other ideas which are more, which I've touched on when I was talking about the Fenians. The Fenians are, are flirting, were flirting with socialism, or the ideas of um, workers, um, the 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 um, the 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 need for 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 the working class to take a a leading role in 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 the events. And um, and socialism spreads in Belfast thanks in part in part to a man called Jim Larkin. He was of Irish descent, but he uh, he grew up in Liverpool. He came over to to uh, to to Belfast as a trade union organizer, and he was very charismatic and he had very powerful. He could make. He, uh, Tremendous speeches. I think that might be him in the centre. There, I'm not entirely sure. You can only see him from the back. I think, um, but that could be him rising to his feet, and uh, and you can see the, this crowd gathered around, 
and these would be the shipyard workers and, and the dock, dockers, the dockers being Catholic predominantly, and the shipyard workers being being Protestant predominantly, but they but they don't care anymore because they're both being ruthlessly exploited. The Cartiers are involved, the Cartiers are mostly Catholic. Um, and then the municipal workers, municipal workers are mostly Protestant. And the and the and the uh, and the and the girls who work in the in the mills, um, who are both Protestant and Catholic, and they all come out and who work in the tobacco factory at, at Gallagher's, they all come out and join the strike bit by bit. And Larkin is the key figure of um, holding it all together. Um, and then even the police come out, yes, believe it or not, because even, even the police are badly paid in Ireland and the, the, um, and the, and the Royal Irish Constabulary uh, comes out and goes on strike as well, because they say, you know, we're, we're, we're being forced to beat people over, over the head all the time. And, um, and, you know, we're not getting very much money for it. So, um, so you know, it's a bit of a selfish interest, but still they come out, which means that British law in in Belfast is suddenly, um, there's suddenly a revolutionary situation. Unfortunately, Jim Larkin uh, doesn't come up to the, to, the, to the grade. If it had been James Connolly, um, his, uh, we'll be speaking about later. He would probably have been different, but he wasn't James James Connolly. It was Jim Larkin. James Connolly, I think, was in America at the time, and um, and and um, and Jim Larkin, although he'd led this, and and it, it had gone, it, it had gone beyond what he felt he could cope with. Um, he has had an unfortunate character running away. From things when they when they looked um, most most uh, promising, and this is exactly what he did in Belfast. He took off to Dublin to organise workers there to organise an, uh, an Irish Trades Union Council, where whereas um, in fact if he'd stayed in Belfast, who knows what might have happened at that point. But it was quite a crucial point which nobody probably realised at the time because. From this moment onwards, the unionists um, suddenly realize how dangerous this idea of workers' unity and socialism, communism, uh, anarchism, whatever you want to call it, is going to be. Um, that they that they didn't um, that they that they make sure that they put all their effort into into dividing the workers as much as possible. Um, and this is where the un the, um, the unionist campaign comes from. Right, this is the start of the unionist campaign. And as I was saying, I was I was drawing your attention to to how the the um, the the propaganda difference in propaganda. We're going to see three images to the one of the Home Rule. Um, because that was roughly the proportion, maybe even four or five to one, in terms of, of the propaganda. Now, these would have been either up on walls or, or they would have been delivered through people's post boxes. Um, and, and it shows you uh, how effective this sort of propaganda could be. And there weren't just Protestant um, unionists, of course, there were also Catholic unionists, now, especially in a place like Dublin, wealthy, wealthy Catholics um, were likely to be unionist. Um, and so, so this is an anti-home rule um, poster. It's, it's also another trope from, from that would be used as part of the British propaganda later on in, in terms of there's, there's this sort of guy who's quite wealthy and he's sitting on, on his on his backside and he's got his his whiskey and he's got his uh, a nice house and all the rest of it and then you've got these uh uh hapless um passive peasants who are being manipulated by this 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 man so it's a sort of conspiracy theory type um approach 
which um uh unwitting unwitting Irish peasants who are being manipulated by by the um uh, by their bosses now th there is an element of truth in this because the the uh the, the, there was a class divide within the home rule movement. We've already been talking about it. And quite a big, in some cases, some quite a big class divide. And, um, but, but, but the workers were not like these sort of hapless peasants there over on the left. They were, they, they would have been aware of it. And that's why you have these contradictions and why you have th things like the Land League and things like this here, which your man on the right would would be dead against um because because the interests involved are are different um so although 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 there is an element of truth in this in this caricature it, it's it's become one of the recurring tropes of um of, used by british interests in ireland to, to present uh, uh, the Irish Republican movement in particular, but also the Irish um, at this time Home Rule movement um, as being as being sort of uh, it, you know the, it's 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 a few a few puppet puppet players who are manipulate you know, rich rich and wealthy puppet players who are playing a ignorant and stupid peasantry who don't know their arse and their elbow. So we've got the next one now. This is this is another trope. Um, so Ulster's question, under which flag? So you've got, you know, you've got this um, uh, sturdy battlement there on, on the left, which has got a Union Jack flying from a united empire. Um, and um, and this is starting to, but Ulster's question, you see, well, what we're starting to see, we're starting to, to see a, um, a uh, identification of the unionist cause with, not with Ireland, but with Ulster. This is the start of it. It hasn't reached its ultimate yet, but this is where it's the direction it's starting to, to go in. Um, and then you can see what what how they view the uh, what 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 it'll look like, um, you know. So the 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 alternative is seen as being Rome rule and um, Devlin. Devlin was the leader of of uh, Belfast um, um, uh, Irish Independence Party um, and. Um, and the um, so it's just a bunch of sandbags, and there's a French flag and a U.S. flag for some reason. Uh, there's the Irish harp over on one side and uh, pirate flag, um, which is even more bizarre, on the other side. So, so this is the sort of stuff which is being churned out and sent to people or put up on 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 walls um, to to um, propagandize them. Right, next. Right, so um, we've missed out one, sorry. So so this one is Ulster's Prayer, Don't Let Go. And um, as you can see, once again, we can see the start of this, um, this uh, using Ulster to, 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 uh, maintain British British rule in Ireland. So uh, John Bull there is over on the right and he's thrown a lasso around around uh, the province of Ulster, uh, holding it with in uh, through Loch Ney, which is in the in, in the middle of 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 Ulster. And um, it, Ireland's drifting away from from Britain. Uh, for some reason, Wales isn't shown at all. It's just somewhere where John Bull can put his boot. Um, the Scotland is shown uh, um, for some reason, uh, but the um, I don't know why it's in green, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. And then you can see the other three provinces of Ireland are trying to to get away, and they're they're about to to come to grief on the Home Rule rocks. So um, 
Uh, and then there's a whole lot of other propaganda thing that they've they've, they've called it. Um, uh, w w um, they've renamed some of the of the of the of the channels and so on um, in the region just just to to emphasize the point. So Ulster's prayer, don't let go. Uh, once again, it's associated with Ulster, and this becomes more and more dominant as we go along. Right, so, so because of this situation, um, it, it's first Asquith, uh, who precedes uh, uh, Lloyd George as British Prime Minister. They're both liberals. Um, Asquith is the one who leads Britain into the First World War. So this is round about 19, sort of 19, well, this, this, this picture is actually from a bit later on because this is Lloyd George, who doesn't come in until the middle, until round about 1916, uh, I think. And, um, and, and he's, I think this is, so this is probably from his 1918 um, home rule uh, bill, which he brings in, and this time it, it gets a massive majority support because Sinn Féin have won a huge landslide in the, in the south. Um, and his idea that this is caricaturing him as as a as a magician. The uh, Lloyd George was also known as the Welsh Wizard. That was his nickname in the press. And uh, he's he's about to do a, a trick which he's never carried out before, according to the to the to the words underneath, uh, which is is to um, chop off or chop um, a map in two, and then he's going to stick it in the in the in the hat, and it's going to come out rejoined together. Um, he says he's ne he's never done this trick before, indicating that it's not going to work. Um, and the other one on, on, on the right here, this is the old called the Old Man of the Sea. And um, this is this is Edward Carson. Now Edward Carson was the leader of the of the uh, unionist movement. He was actually a Dublin uh, lawyer. He was he was a lawyer. He's actually yeah. infamously he's uh, he's linked because he was the prosecutor of uh, Oscar Wilde. Uh, so it gives you sort of an idea what sort of man he was. Um, he wasn't any 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 friend to any progressive uh, thoughts at all. Um, he was an out and out Tory and a uh, and a reactionary, and he he um, he he became the leader of the of the unionist movement. Um, and he was he was extremely extremely right wing, but but this this is actually a caricature of him. So it, it's it's he's saying I'll be loyal even if I have to wreck the empire. And John Bull, who's sweating underneath the weight of him, he says, "Well, you've made a start. Heard from Belfast lately, meaning the trouble in Belfast." Okay, so. Um, before we we move on to talk about the the critical situation in Ireland leading up to the First World War, we'll just mention uh, this character here, James Connolly. Now, the the other figure is is actually Jim Larkin. You know, I was talking about Jim Larkin earlier. He was in another union leader. Um, James Connolly was also a union leader. He was involved in in many different different. Um, radical causes. Uh, he's sometimes connected to ev everything from Irish republicanism to um, to trade unionism, to revolutionary syndicalism. I would argue he's actually closest to radical revolutionary syndicalism, but um, we can, that's, that's, that's for another topic maybe. Um, and um, he was also um, a socialist, and he was also um, he was also a proto-feminist. He was a very very supportive of uh, women women getting the vote and women getting equal 
equal equal rights in the law. Um, and he was, he was anti-clerical, um, well, both anti-Catholic and anti-Protestant clerical. He came up with a, a number of different quotes, which are some some of them are very important. Um, this one is governments in capitalist society are but committees of the rich to manage their affairs or the affairs of the capitalist class. Um, another one he would make, which was very prophetic, um, is that uh, partition, if it was implemented, uh, because he didn't live as long enough to see partition, Competition, if it was implemented, would mean a carnival of reaction on both sides of the border. And we can see shortly how that came, uh, actually, that prophecy was actually fulfilled. Um, the, the man, as I say, in the, in the smaller man with the, his arms outstretched, that's Jim Larkin uh, uh, in, in full flow, um, I think in Dublin during the 1913 lockout, which James Connolly was involved in as well. And the flag over there on, on the right, that's the Irish Starry Plough, which is a, 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 um, a flag developed by James Connolly and his collaborators. Um, and it symbolizes the worker working at the plough, um and it has a few other symbolisms to it as well but this was his his take on what a new irish flag could look like um an irish flag that represented the irish working class irrespective of whether they were catholic protestant or dissenter or atheist even. right next one so um so this is this is the start of the big reactionary movement so we've been talking about the propaganda campaign building up we're now dealing with the actual um, heavy uh, the actual collateral being brought in now these are the wet unloading guns um, now the the British authorities didn't didn't interfere with this at all there were two main main um, drop-offs uh, there was one at Larne and there was another one at Donoghadee the British authorities did not intervene at all. They didn't stop them doing this. Uh, they, they were quite brazen about what they were doing. Uh, this is the, uh, the start of the arming of the Ulster Volunteer Force, which is a paramilitary group set up by the Unionist leaders uh, to, to allegedly def to prevent home rule in, in Ireland. And, you know, for, didn't, at that point, it didn't really matter. They weren't talking about so much about an independent Ulster, or at least in public, what they were talking about was, was uh, preventing home rule throughout Ireland. And this paramilitary force was, a, because of the Protestant majority in, in the North, they would um, be able, uh, able to, um, that was where their, their, their foot sloggers would mostly come from. So, so they got a whole big supply of well, well um equipped um or you know well well um uh so modern modern british british rifles um at both at Larne and and on Hadi without without the british occupation forces uh intervening with them at all so so this this starts to set a a uh, a pattern and the Irish uh, Home Rule Party or the Irish Independence Party, they um, they suddenly find themselves outflanked by Republicans. And the Republicans are thinking, well, if, if these unionists are getting armed up, we'll have to get armed up as well. So, so there is a a um, a similar landing under much more um, severe circumstances or much more dangerous circumstances than this landing uh there's a there's one in in start in the middle of 1914 just before the first world war in fact uh where they land 1500 rifles at Houth in in dublin these are old german mausers they're bought, bought from the german government because the german government it, this, these are antiquated weapons they're no longer of any use 
Um, so, so therefore the Republicans get them at a discount. Um, and they are also probably thinking, because they're probably thinking, well, we've got a war coming up. Um, so or we may have a war coming up. So we're, we're going to um, arm the, uh, you know, w w we're quite happy to give the, the Irish um, some, some guns. But uh, as I say, there's quite a big difference between what's landed in in in, in Donacha D and in and in Larn, both in terms of of the quantity um, and also in, in terms of the interference it gets and the quality of the, these weapons compared with what the Irish volunteers, which is the Irish equivalent of the of the uh, UVF or Ulster volunteers. Um, uh, forces comes in. Um, and then this is compounded, the, this sort of um, quite dangerous situation close to civil war starts to develop in Ireland. And it also ties in with industrial unrest um, right across Britain as well. And general unrest, in fact, um, against the, against the, uh, the against the British government and and uh, not only its liberal form but also the Tory form, um, and um, and there there is a um, the, the, this is this is what happens in in Ireland. This is this is this is a, a it's the Cora con conspiracy and it's um, a general. Well, actually, it was more than one general. Uh, they they led a a um, a supporting. Uh, they were going to intervene to prevent home rule being enacted, and and they um, and and these these generals were quite prepared to mutiny, and there was an obvious attempt that if if the if the home rule bill was passed by the Liberal government, the Asquith government. They would um, they would disobey orders and they would uh, start a reactionary um, sort of Tory takeover of of, of government, um, starting in Ireland and spreading spreading to England. Um, and there were military movements, and it for a while it it, it really looked quite dangerous. So the British were quite. British government was actually quite relieved to get involved in the First World War because at least they, they didn't have to cope with this, um, you know, an actual actual mutiny um, of the far far right, as you were, or the the right wing of British politics. Um, they, they were actually involved in 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 a mutiny and um, and a um, um, a counter revolutionary uh, move. Similar much to, to what Franco was going to attempt in, in the 1930s, in fact, um, but but in Britain and um, the and on one side and um, militant left wing and Irish nationalist forces on the other side. So they didn't want that, so they went into the First World War instead, and we know how well that worked out. All right, next slide. So in the middle of the First World War, uh, there's an uprising in Dublin. This is the uh, GPO or General Post Office, which is the headquarters. James Connolly was in here along with many other of the Irish leaders um, who took part. This was an uprising by a minority of the, of the uh, Irish volunteers who took part in, the, in this uprising. Along with the Irish Citizen Army, which was, which was uh, actually originally a force to protect the rights of um, of of Dublin Dublin workers, but to pr protect them from from the from the police, um, and they also took part uh, because James James Connolly decided to commit himself to this uh, because uh, the only other option was to stand aside from it. And um, and then you would have to have to pay the political price of that because it would it would um, it would it would mean that the um, 
at least if they did take part in it, even though they're a small, small group, smaller group than the Irish volunteers, they would uh, they would be able to 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 lay a claim on 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 what new form, assuming that there would be a new form in Ireland, a new new um, new um, system, new new administration, new new social relations in Ireland. Um, that that the Irish working class would have a say in that. So that was the intention, anyway. And you can see some of the ruins because the British shelled uh, centre of Dublin quite badly, and um, a lot of people were killed. Uh, some people killed by the Irish volunteers. Some people killed by the British military. Uh, British military also took reprisals, and that didn't work out very well for them. It started off um, the the um, the 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 ball rolling from the Irish Independence Party, uh, the Home Rulers, the Reformists, to the Revolutionaries, to the uh, Re Republican movement. Okay, um, now up in up in our in the north of Ireland, um, as the First World War draws to a close. You have a big anti-conscription campaign. This is the first first move, um, and um, because Britain tries to introduce in conscription into Ireland, which is up until then has been up until nineteen eighteen has been um, exempt, um, and that and that builds big big um, opposition to it, and um, the. And then the Unionist forces um, start to, to, to get mobilised. But just before they do, in 1919, um, there is an, uh, or from the end of 1918 to the start of 1919, there is a, a series of uprisings in Britain. Um, there's naval revolts, uh, naval mutiny. There's... Um, there's workers uh, go go on strike. They try to organise a general strike um, in Britain, and certain areas try to go further than that. They try to set up workers' Soviets. Um, this is particularly the case in places like Liverpool and and Glasgow, and of course, this is Liverpool and Glasgow are very closely connected to Belfast, and the 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 workers. In in Belfast, the their leaders unfortunately made a stupid decision. They decide to to um, because they're under pressure from from a very strong by this point very strong unionist um, uh, environment. Uh, it will virtually you know you, you can't dissent anymore from from the unionist. Uh, if you're if you're Protestant, you can't dissent, um, or or you're likely to be um, handed. And um, and the and the so so they they go on strike in connection with the with the with the with the strikes in 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 Britain, um, and they they demand a forty four hour day. Um, and but they but they but they don't want to be connected with Red Clydeside because because they're afraid basically so so they so they don't connect to 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 Red Clydeside and because of that so they're so playing they're playing two horses at the same time and um, in the end both both horses lose um, they have to break the strike they they can't continue with it and the um well the what, what happens is that the the um unist leaders say oh okay we'll 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 give you your 44 hour day and then they take it away from them as soon as they um come off strike and then they go on, on a hunt for all catholics who work in the shipyard so all, all of them get thrown out of their jobs or their houses burned out or whatever and something similar happens to to the Protestant leaders of the strike, who, um, as I say, the shipyard workers are predominantly 
um, or almost in, entirely, certainly in the skilled jobs, are uh, almost entirely uh, Protestant. Um, in a wide, in the wider sense, including um, uh, Anglican and dissenter, and um, and they get um, eliminated immediately that they've that they've um, stopped the strike. Uh, so it's, it's very unfortunate decisions made there by the union leaders in in Belfast to to accommodate unionism instead of opposing it. Um, this is an Orange Order parade. Now, the Orange Order we can deal with in a, in a later episode, much more detail. But it, it was this reactionary organization which I was talking about, um, which was very violently anti anti Catholic. Um, it goes back to the 1690s um, in its in its not not in its or, in origins as an organization, but in terms of its. Um, of its, uh, what it looks back on. It looks back on the so-called glorious revolution of, of British history, um, where the King uh, William III, who was actually a, a Dutch prince, um, comes over to, to rescue the Protestants, allegedly, according to the, the legend, um, from, from the foul papists in Ireland and defeats them at the Battle of the Boyne, blah, blah, blah. And um, and the, the it's it, it becomes from 1790 onwards it becomes as predominantly as I say Anglican or in fact entirely Anglican in, in its origins and slowly starts to let in dissenters bit by bit and eventually the two become virtually indistinguishable um, but they all identify as Protestants and they join join the orange order in order to um it you know the the whole uh, motifs which they were dealing with is like this uh this um anger and fear directed against catholics and what they're capable of uh entirely sectarian movement and there you can see them starting they're parading through through belfast in 1919 uh, this is the start uh, after the strike has been broken um, the, the only chance of of going in a socialist uh, anything going in a socialist direction, and in fact, it's it goes the opposite way. So you you start to see sectarian riots, and this is what happens here. So workers are chased out of the shipyards if they're Catholic, or if they're Protestant socialists as well, they they get chased out of there, and then people get burned out of their homes or they get burned uh, their their businesses you know catholic businesses get burned down um and there's also as, as i said the there's these paramilitary forces descend that were set up before uh, before the first world war the ulster volunteer force a lot of these people um the ones that haven't uh, enrolled to join in the british army and have got themselves slaughtered at the battle of the somme um they they um they 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 join this this new paramilitary police force because Britain is starting to mobilize um its its control. It doesn't want to lose the shipyards, it doesn't want to lose control of the of the, the Northern Ireland industries and and there's a big locally vested interest of the is particularly the landlord and capitalist class almost entirely by now um, are unionist if they're Protestant and they um, and they are able to and they've been because they've been working at it so long and because the the opposition has been so ineffective um, in terms of you know what what the what the the nationalists and what the socialists um, are up to they had an opportunity in 1907 in particular, they, they blew it um, by 1919. You can see how weak it is. Um, and the so it become, everything becomes really sectarianized. And uh, it's predominantly because the power is with the unionists. Um, it's predominantly, um, and because it's been sectarianized, it's predominantly, um, Protestants who are 
um, who are mob mob using mob rule against 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 Catholics, but not entirely. Sometimes it works the other way as well. Um, next is this. This is the start of the uh, Royal Ulster Constabulary. Now, this is the what's known as the Special Royal Ulster Constabulary. Now, the Royal Ulster Constabulary is a successor to the Royal Irish Constabulary, who we mentioned earlier. Um, this is entirely to to patrol Ulster, um, whatever Ulster is going to be. They still haven't firmly decided whether Ulster is going to be four counties or whether it's going to be six counties or even the whole nine counties. They haven't decided that yet, but they have set up this uh, paramilitary police force. Um, now, this isn't the first time the Br British government set up paramilitary police force. In fact, Ireland has had paramilitary police force um, pretty much since British rule began. Um, it's had special constabulary forces raised as suited the in, in the occasion. So wherever there, there was trouble, they, they raised a special constabulary force. But the Royal, the, the Ulster special constabulary is different in that it is almost 100% Protestant. Um, uh, and that, that is considered to be um, a qualification for joining them. And they are irregulars and they are, um, and they're known for their lack of discipline. They operate uh, in this period, a bit like the um, black and tans, and the auxiliary forces in the, in in what's now developed into the Irish War of Independence in the South against um, the IRA, and they they commit atrocities, um, and they commit um, and they commit uh, uh, lootings and various other uh, and and uh, disappearances of people and and as, you know people have been taken away. From their homes and then and then shot and their bodies dumped in a bog somewhere. Um, this this becomes you know and these people are supposed to be police, okay? So so that this is the the A constabulary. There was A, B, and C constable groups, and this is these people I believe are A, are um, are A specials rather than the next picture we're going to have here is these are the B specials and there's not a huge amount of difference um, except that the B specials are even less regular they're also the largest group and they're the group that will continue on beyond the Irish independence war strokes of a war period um, and uh, here they are in a Lancia armoured car and um, they they are um, as I say a lot of them are former paramilitaries who were in the Ulster Volunteer Force before the war, um, and they're basically some of them are just outright criminals um, who are who are uh, glad to take advantage of their of their authority and to just. Um, Rob people and and uh, to to sexually assault women. Um, There's a particular horrific um, incident of, in South Armagh of of um, sexual assault, multiple rape, in fact, um, done committed by members of the of the uh, of the royal uh, of the of the, of the B specials. And the IRA as a response, um, because the IRA was a sort of operating very, uh, very low key, but it was still operating and it, it was carrying out reprisals of its own, of course. And it commits one of the worst single atrocities. As I say, these sort of incidents were predominantly con committed by the special constabularies and um uh, but they were like one one person here one person there two people there three people there whatever um but the ira decides to put a stop to this 
with uh, what's an, uh, as an attack on a Protestant community in South Down, just outside Newry, and um, and the and the result is quite, quite horrific. And they 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 basically break into people's houses and they shoot any man they encounter, and they also um, shoot a woman, whether they shot her by accident or whether they shot her by design, we don't know. Um, but but of course, um, what it does do, um, which we have to admit, even though it's not nice to admit it, is it does put a stop to the deprivation temporary stop to the depred depredations of the, particularly the bee specialists. Um, but, but the, you, you know, what it does in terms of the damage it does for community relations in terms of it, and, you know, anything, anything that's going to achieve the aims of the United Irishmen, for instance, you know, the uni unity of Catholic Protestant dissenter are gone forever because um, it's basically 10, 10 random Protestants or nine random Protestants rather in Alton Bay, where this massacre takes place, are just gunned down. And unfortunately, this this incident gets repeated much later on in in the history, which we'll be dealing with uh, more or less very tragic situation um in in much the same sort of circumstances um but this but in in the next time it's even more sinister because it actually involves the british state um british state manipulating both sides to this end um in this case i don't think that was the case i think it was it was decisions made by 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 the local B special commanders and by um, local IRA commanders, Frank Aitken being one of them um, on the IRA side, who was di directly responsible for for the Altnavay massacre, we believe. He later became a free state politician, um, uh, and uh, and in the early period of the Republic. He was served in the De Valera government, um, but he he completely transformed himself by that point. Uh, and he uh, was not, was not, um, he was not, not an advocate of, of um, such reprisals. Right, next, next. Um, now this is very interesting um, because this is, this is um, what was going on uh, now, as, as we were talking about, there, there, was a, there was an independence war going on. The IRA, the Irish Repub Republican Army, has been set up uh, to because the, the British are taking forever on implementing Home Rule. And although, although, um, although uh, the, the, there's been a huge majority in, in uh, 73 seats out of, I think, uh, about 100 and, 107 or something, um, that that are uh, Sinn Fein, um, who are Republicans, not not um, not Home Rulers. Um, there's a, a few, only a few Home Rulers get in this time, about half a dozen or less, uh, and the rest of the of the of the MPs elected are unionists. There's one or two socialists um, of a sort, socialist unionists. Um, and um, and then there is um, so so um, so the uh, the the um, what is what is often missed out in 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 accounts of this period is that many people many uh, workers in the south were were influenced by what was happening in places like Russia and in parts of Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, um, a general uprising of workers um, under the red flag. And um, this actually takes place in Ireland as well. A lot of people in Ireland had no idea about this sort of stuff until recently. And then there was a, a gradual 
uh, 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 realization that there had been a worker Soviet in Limerick and the city of Limerick, which is on the on the um, mid mid west coast of Ireland, and um, and and they and they took over most of the city, and they also in uh, they they introduced their own money. And they um, they made m several demands on the on the count um, on the British authorities and on the council. They refused to serve British British armed forces, which were trying to operate against the IRA. Um, so you can see that it, it was both an anti-imperialist um, and also a they ran up the red flag so th and they were actually trying to print their own money they were trying to be act autonomously so in some respects this is much more like what james connolly um because he was a syndicalist this was this is what he would have advocated and unfortunately if he'd lived um he might have been able to leave this movement but unfortunately it was like it grew up it uh, it emerged here and there and um, to a much greater extent than we previously thought. There's been recent research, and we now know that there was a lot more of these Soviets, and that they exist, that they came into existence between the period of roughly uh, 1919 and 1922. Uh, so they overlapped both the War of Independence, the truce in between, and the Civil War. And um, and they and and the first sign of it would be uh, it was predominantly in agricultural or rural areas, uh, which again you wouldn't surprise you wouldn't suspect because you'd think these are the areas most likely to be under the influence of the Catholic Church, but in fact um, these are the areas in in Ireland, not not in Dublin, not in not in Belfast. Where they uh, where they start to fly the red flag and they start to um, to demand workers' rights because they sense some some form of Irish independence is coming, and the workers want to lay their own their own claims, their own interpretation of what independence might be. So so this is a one shilling note which came out during the general strike against British militarism, which was organized from, Lim from Limerick in 1919. Um, very interesting um, document, that one. Um, and then in the next picture, you can see that this is, this is one of the most radical of them all, um, set up in Brewery in, in, um, it, in Southern Ireland. And um, it, th this was a free workers Soviet mill. So um, it was a Sovietized mill. This is the, the term they used. What they meant was a workers council was running, was running the mill instead of the owners. The owners um, were forced to negotiate with them. Um, and they, their slogan is very interesting. We make bread, not profits. And this is in Ireland. This is in conservative Catholic Ireland in the 19, early 1920s. You wouldn't really expect this. Um, but pretty much all the workers involved uh, who worked in this place were involved. Um, and they were they made some very militant um, demands. And, and um, unfortunately, to the disgrace of the IRA, um, the IRA, uh, uh, Constance Mark Markovic, the alleged uh, rebel countess, she told them, um, this is during the, during the truce, because they were a bit later on, they were sort of 1921 to 22 was, was the period, um, and they they'd had uh, emerged during, during the truce, and Constance Markovic, was in charge of the, the RA. We have the civil war is developing. Um, well, she wasn't in charge of the RA, but she's uh, certainly high up in it. And and she she um, she said, if you don't if you don't um, if you don't stop making these demands uh, for uh, against the owners of the 
of the of the mills, we're going to I'm going to send in the IRA against you. Um, you know that, that was a disgraceful decision made by um, Ms. Markovic, and um, it was uh, in flat contradiction. She was allegedly a socialist a Republican, allegedly, uh, but she was more afraid of of um, of of uh, um, of getting the disapproval of the capitalist class in Ireland, whether Catholic or Protestant, and she was defending workers' rights. And these workers were very extremely brave and extremely radical. The, you know, I mean, if you think about it, um, rural Ireland um, and uh, uh, very poor and not much in the way of information, but they'd obviously heard about the, the Russian Revolution and they wanted to imitate it. Um, not imitate it in the Leninist sense, but to imitate it in the sense of workers' uh, councils taking over taking over the, the means of production. And uh, there was also creameries, so uh, um, where it were taken over, there was taken over of, of um, land as well. Um, and all of these things, uh, unfortunately, received the the um, the bad attention in general, not entirely, but in general, um, of both the anti-treaty and pro-treaty IRA, uh, well, the, the anti-treaty IRA in the Civil War and the, and the pro-treaty government army um, as well. And they, and they, and between them, they, they, they closed down the, all these places one after another. There was another one in a, in a, a mental hospital. This was actually the first one. And it was led by a Republican, um, a radical Republican who didn't, didn't uh, behave like uh, Ms. Markovich, but his name was Padder O'Donnell. And um, there was a dispute because the, the, um, the workers were working 93 hours a week. Can you imagine that? 93 hours a week. Um, and they and they were fed up with that and they and they rebelled and they said, we're not doing that. And then they brought the patients in and the patients joined in, joined in the, the occupation and the strike as well. Army were called in, the army refused to, to open fire. Um, and um, and they got ever they got more, pretty much everything they they demanded. This was actually the first the first um, of the of the Soviets. Um, uh, and they must have inspired the other ones as well. But there was quite a lot of them, and we're discovering more and more evidence of more and more of these uh, small scale Soviets being set up over Ireland and and a vision of what Irish independence might have looked like if it had been allowed to go in a different different direction. And it could even have brought in, uh, because it, was, it, was, um, it wasn't sectarian and it was under a red flag than, than under, under a, um, you know, a, what was perceived as being a, a, a green flag or whatever. Um, that it, it could have even brought in sections of of, of the Protestant um, working class. Anyway, um, so unfortunately, or whatever happens, the the anti anti treaty forces are defeated in the civil war quite quickly, in fact, um, because the pro treaty forces are being armed 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 up by the British and um, the and the the British are giving them intelligence and all the rest of it and um, the and the anti-treaty forces as I said they they don't stick with the working class they decide to to vacillate and to to um to 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 side with property interests and with the Catholic Church against against the people, so the people get fed up with that and they don't give them any support either. 
So that so that's the end of the anti-treaty forces. Um, the pro-treaty forces win, and of course, and they start to implement quite um, quite uh, reactionary policies, as James Connolly uh, predicted. So you've got a kind of a reaction both north and south, and the um, the reaction down south is the all all the poverty that's been associated with Britain is is um is continued and in some cases it's even it's even increased um so the emigration rate goes shooting up uh because as well as that anybody who's been taken the other side in the in the civil civil war um they're made out they're no longer welcome either and and anybody who's a socialist is no longer welcome so so they're told to get in a boat and hop, hop skip and jump uh, away and the um and the this this is a photograph from waterford in the middle 1920s it gives you an idea of the, of the poverty this is a an urban area but um but it, it it gives you an idea of the sort of squalor which was continuing in the period after the after the um the end of the end of the civil war and um so continued squalor um and uh but now you've got the priests are running around and the priests are trying to tell everybody the only reason why you're living in squalor is because the um uh because you're bad people and and you're not you're not um you're not going to mass enough and um and you you have to you have to um uh have a, a, you, you know you have to have as many many as many children as, as possible and you've got to um do all the things that, that you're supposed to do as a catholic um let's say your last your um your rosaries and all the rest of it and um and this becomes much you know and and then then you might get get some salvation um but this is the reality of what what that salvation looks like um and it would be be the same in the in the rural areas now the rural areas in this period and this is approximately from about 1924 um to 1926 um we know now because there's been some additional research done that that in uh, the Ireland faced a famine, another famine, and this would have been caused not, um, or the primary people responsible would not have been, no longer would have been the British government or the British government's agents, but would have actually been Irish government agents, um, governments of the free state. Um, and, and the government of the free state was uh, wedded to a a policy, not initially. They they did actually try to relieve the famine, and the, the famine would have had similar similar causes to the first one. Um, but it, it it didn't it didn't reach anything like the proportions um, in terms of catastrophe that the, the other one did. But it was on the brink of doing so, and it was only saved by a good harvest in nineteen twenty six. Um, when the potato crop, um, which had been de badly damaged in 1924, 25, in 1926, there was suddenly a very good harvest, and that's what um, saved saved Ireland. Not not the policy of the government. The policy of the government, however, in early 1924, was it was to 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 um, introduce r r r r relief. Um, but in in um, but 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 then they changed tune because they 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 didn't want to to look bad in the in international eyes. So they suppressed all knowledge of this, and it's only recently that that the information has come out again. And um, but we know that round about seven hundred and fifty thousand people were on the borderline of famine, and we know that some of those died. Um, we don't know exactly how many, but it w wouldn't have been, it wouldn't probably be more than 
maybe a thousand or so actually died um, as a result. But I mean, still a thousand people dying of hunger is not is not exactly um, marvelous, is it? Especially for a new new state being set up. And um, in addition, the the new government, as I said, it was suppressing all these um, Soviets and workers' councils, which were being set up in the countryside. Um, so it was bu busily, busy, ruthlessly suppressing those at the same time and ripping down the red flags and everything else. And it was also, um, there was also a policy of breaking any unions that might be starting, that were already starting up, of course, um, in that period, and so so all the all the, all the unions had to be broken, and there was a campaign to reduce wages. You imagine, I mean, if you're living in a place like this here, and and your wages are reduced by sixteen percent, that was what their their um, their goal was. Their goal was to support the big farmers um, and the few capitalists that there were in the south. Um, but because they have this uh, this uh, market market dominated theory of um, you know if, if you just let market forces go rip, much the same as Lord Russell had in in the middle of the nineteenth century, um, then then uh, then you know the wealth will build and uh, and it'll all trickle down to the to the bottom, as you can see. It hasn't trickled down very far as far as the slum is concerned. And it would certainly be the case on the west coast of Ireland as well. So so there was a campaign to to stamp out uh, because there were various labor unrests going on, especially in rural areas. Agricultural laborers were trying to fight for their rights. They had to be stamped out and wages forced down by 16 percent. Um, it the only people that benefited were the were the rich now by now overwhelmingly Catholic farmers the, um, the these would become the backbone of the of the free of the emergent free state so so it, verily as Connolly predicted um, a carnival the partition will lead to a carnival of reaction on both sides of the border. Right, this is just um, a slide here that shows Ireland before 1921. So you can see um, Connacht over there on the uh, um, in the west, far west, and Ulster in the north. Um, this is and Leinster in the east and Munster in the south. These are the four administrative divisions. Just to recap, that um, that the British administration had. Had uh, had agreed for Ireland in the 17th century, late 17th century, and which had continued right on through to the um, to the early 20th century, when it was divided up as as shown on the right, where you've got this rather strange um, formation called Northern Ireland, because uh, they eventually decide uh, they have this this uh, commission, which is known as the Boundary Commission. And everybody thinks, both the Free Staters and the people in, in what's to become Northern Ireland, they think that, um, that this will be a temporary thing and that it will, uh, it won't, it won't, um, a temporary formation that will not, not, um, it, it'll, it'll disappear in a few years. Um, once, once um, both sides have, have re um, have re um, configured, and you know, and they haven't, uh, and they they've come to an agreement. This agreement never takes place, um, and uh, Northern Ireland is, is 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 set up from these six counties here in in Ulster. So all what they call Ulster. Is not actually Ulster. It's it's actually um, it's actually part of Ulster. It's it's a majority part of Ulster, but it's still um, there are elements of Ulster which are in in the south or in the twenty six counties. You've got Donegal over there, 
you've got Cavan and you've got Monaghan. These are the ones in the south. And then you've got Armagh, Down, Antrim, Derry, and um, Tyrone and Fermanagh, which are the six here that form, form Northern Ireland. Um, very strange formation, uh, but but it's what the the uh, the authorities who are now being set up as a as a in, in the same way as a sort of devolved government has been set up in free state. The free state is actually still beholden to the British. They still have British occupation forces um, garrisoned within them, especially in Cove um, uh, Harbour here in um, in Cork. And um, and and in in one or two other places as well, um, the rest of the British forces start to pull out. But uh, the the uh, the much of much of the administration they're still using sterling um, until until much later on, and um, so so the currency is the same. And the um, so it's a very nominal independence. The flag, I can't remember what the free what the free state flag is, is, but it's not the tricolor that one normally associates uh, the republic with. Um, and it's it's um, in addition, it's it's ruled pretty much by British finance and British interests. Um, so all the all the agricultural produce um, goes as before, goes through Ireland and it and exits at Dublin or one or two other um, uh, um, ports and it goes across to Britain, just like before. And the 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 because they they've decided not to to challenge private property the pro, uh, private property relations remain exactly the same so you still have very rich farmers and extremely poor farmers who have to mostly their their offspring have to emigrate um, out of the country um very poverty stricken um northern ireland slightly better it, it depends what region of northern ireland you're in but around Belfast, um, you know, this is considered to be the prosperous area. Uh, so you've got this this area here, uh, in particular, is relatively prosperous, um, and um, and it's also where the biggest concentration of population is. It, it's um, it, it's and and. Uh, and the and the best land is owned by Protestants usually in the in 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 Ireland and because of the Orange Order, Orange Order allows um, the, it's it's um, Protestant tenants rights over land which the which is denied to the Catholic um, tenants and the Catholic tenants are restricted to hill farms by and large. Um, but also there are Protestant hill farmers as well. And, uh, you know, there's, so there's quite a bit of squalor is dis distributed. And, and it, you know, is, and especially in Belfast, squalor is fairly evenly distributed between Catholic and Protestant areas. Um, but the ideology, the dominant ideology of Northern Ireland becomes this unionist one where, the, where they tell you Rightly or wrongly, if you're Protestant, that that you um, that you are have a birthright there, um, which is denied to the Catholics, and you you should get privileged in jobs, and you should get privileged uh, in 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 uh, housing and all the rest of it, which you don't really get in reality, but um, but but it's it's good it's good for propaganda. So so these are the two two. Um, uh, formations which are emerging in Ireland and the damage we can see um, which is coming out of out of the partition uh, process. Now the the Boundary Commission, I was talking about them, so the Boundary Commission is is uh, conducted in private and, and and everybody believes both both people in Northern Ireland and and in the Free State 
um, they they believe that um, that it'll all be resolved fairly soon and it'll all be equitable and and uh, and uh, the and and it won't last very long. Um, but what really happens is it gets buried. It gets buried by the new Northern Ireland um, local government, which gets set up under um, James Craig, um, who's who becomes the first premier of Northern Ireland at uh, Stormont in um, in 1922, um, and he takes a hold of a parliament, which is or is Stormont. Um, assembly, which is um, which is it, uh, have, uh, completely dominated by unionists, uh, and they pretty much force the, the the few nationalists into into an opposition that never gets never is allowed even to get a breath of power, and um, and they and they and, and they start to introduce. Uh, uh, unionist rule, and um, as it will be experienced right up until about 1969-70. And um, so, so, so they get a devolved government in, in, um, in Northern Ireland and the British basically aren't interested in what they get up to. Uh, they aren't interested in the discrimination or or the or the squalor, um, you know, which which the which the the um, which the unionist leaders want to keep everybody, whether they're Protestant or Catholic, um, if they're working class, in, um, and and the and they um, and they just basically let them let them get on with it. Um, because uh, they're they're glad to be shot of Ireland, uh, in a sense, uh, but to, it comes back to bite them later on, of course. Um, but at at the time, they think that they've got a solution here. Um, now we can see, have a look at how good the solution might be. Right. So every now and again, there's an emergency. Um, this is a 1920s uh, photograph showing um, uh, these are this is a roadblock set up by the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which I said are, are the descent. Uh, now, now these are no, not the special constabulary, but they are just ordinary policemen. Um, I say when I say ordinary policemen, they're still overwhelmingly Protestant, and they they are armed but um, not obviously armed in order of rifles and stuff. They have, uh, have uh, revolvers, but not, but not rifles. Um, and they are, and in, in an in emergency, like when they think that there is a bit of unrest or whatever, then these guys would, would come in, in the border areas and they would, uh, and they would set up roadblocks it's often in the middle of a town. I mean, you know, because because it was county boundaries which were being divided up. So, um, so you know, the, these these buildings over there are in, are, might be in the in in the in the north, um, and and the buildings which you can't see on the on the other side, um, it, it'd be part of the same village really, but um, but they'd be in the in the in in the free state and so so you see somebody being being um having their car um or truck uh being being searched by the police there's three of them there and there's a guy on a horseback over there as well so so this is this is the sort of day-to-day -day routine nonsense which would happen in a, uh, if there was perceived to be a threat or an emergency, you know, somebody had been seen smuggling a rifle or allegedly seen smuggling a rifle from point A to point B across the border, then they'd set up one of these and then they'd search everybody and, and make, make uh, they'd pick on Catholics, of course, because that would um, help to, to, um, 
to appease the unionists and to also um, also divide people. So um, so so this would be generally what they would do. Um, but in the majority, you might get police like this. Now I'm not entirely sure this is is a police. I mean, it might be a, might be a um, a, a postman. <laughs> Um, but but this is the sort of mundane, uh, very unglamorous task of a lot of rural policemen in the border areas would have got on with. It's very well described by the poet Seamus Heaney. I'm not entirely fond of Seamus Heaney's stuff in general, but but this one is quite a good one uh, where he uh, he talks about um, his experiences as a young boy growing up in the um in a rural um on a rural catholic farm in in a border area and the arrival of a policeman every every year would be well, once a year he would arrive with his tax ledger so this here could be a tax ledger possibly over his shoulder and he's on a bike which he is in which is in is in in the poem he carries a revolver by his um his side, and he's sort of like seen as a threat. Um, so, uh, despite the fact he's just like uh, Joe Bloggs on a on a on a on a cycle, uh, cycling through the, the grey Irish weather and the and the little wee tracks that he's that he's uh, cycling on, you know they're they're um, you know he's probably covered in mud by the time he gets. Back to the barracks. So, so, so this is sort of mundane existence, which, which uh, it, it, it's quite good in that way. It, uh, it not only encapsulates the the uh, the the image from from the poem, but but it also it also works in that it it um, it it. it um, it exposes how dreary and how boring the majority of the this activity was and how uselessly oppressive it would have been because you know he's coming down with his tax ledger he's got to, he's got to um ask all, all the catholic hill farmers well have you uh, um what's your output for this year and all the rest of it which is an intrusion really and you know when you don't really recognize the the government and then they and this guy comes along in, a, in his boots and with a with a, a, a sidearm and he he wants to know everything and there's this threat hanging in the air of what what could happen to you if you if you don't tell him the truth Right, um, and then this is the final picture here, which um, shows quite, quite uh, uh, distinctly and very clearly what's how absurd the border was. Um, not only does the border go through um, villages, it also goes through fields. So, like so a farmer might have some fields in the Republic, and well, it wouldn't be in the Republic then, in the Free State, and some fields in the in what's known as Northern Ireland. Um, but um, this this shows how absurd it could actually reach um, the levels of absurdity, where a house is actually divided into two. So the kitchen or whatever is on the right there. That's in the in the twenty six counties or the what would have been the free state um, later on the republic and the the and the rest of the of the building is in the six counties or the or Northern Ireland. Um, so so what 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 how does that work? Um, well, you, you ask me. Um, I really have no idea. And um, I did actually meet while I was at Queen's University in Belfast. I did actually meet a guy who, who used to live in a property that was, it probably didn't look like this. This is quite an early, you know, typical thatched cottage type thing, typical Irish thatched cottage. But, um, but back in the, in, in the day, um, 
uh and um but but he he lived in a in a house um that was half half of it was in 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 the in the republic and half of it was in northern ireland and he said if i go to the bathroom i'm in i'm in the republic and if i if i go to my bedroom i'm in the i'm in i'm in the i'm in northern ireland so so this is an this just gives you an idea of how uh, absurd it all was. Right, we are going to stop here and we will be coming back for part two. Part two will be dealing predominantly with the 1930s. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the 1930s and uh, we'll, we'll maybe take it on into the, into the, into the Second World War um, period. That, that's quite interesting as well and might even take it as far as the 1950s. Um, and then and then we will start to move on to to what is known as the troubles and and the um, civil rights movement and all that stuff. But 